Hello and welcome back to Visions for Health. I'm Wendy Trubo, Chief Operating Officer and Gynecologist at Visions Healthcare, and my guest today is Linda Cleary, Certified Physician's Assistant. Thanks yeah. for being here. Thank you. Thank welcome. you for having me. So you're a Certified Physician's Assistant. Yeah. What does this mean? Um, in my program when I went to school, we were offered uh, an option to be certified at the time. It was a degree program, our certificate program, but this was in 1991 to 93. Um, since that time, a lot has changed. Okay. So that means that there are people who aren't certified or they're phasing out or? Uh, I wouldn't say phasing out. I would say they were grandfathered in. Got it. Um, okay. Now, most of the programs you see now and graduates that are coming out now absolutely have a certificate. Most of them actually have a master's degree now. So what's a physician's assistant and how does it differ from a nurse practitioner or a medical doctor or, or what? That's probably the most asked question that I get. Um, I guess the best answer for me has always been to describe the way that we were trained. In a physician assistant program, um, even our certification when we get tested, it's run by the AMA. Um, whereas a nurse practitioner program is more on a nursing model. Um, from my understanding, in a nurse practitioner program, a lot of them pick what it is they'd like to go into and then for the next two years kind of focus on that degree, i.e. family medicine or primary care. Um, in a physician assistant model, we tend to get a huge spectrum and we rotate through with um, third and fourth year medical students. Um, so we are actually offered to rotate through things like surgery and primary care and urgent care and I would say there may be a little bit more surgery involved when you encounter a physician assistant or find us in that spectrum. Um, that would probably be the biggest difference that I see, but as far as coming out and practicing, I have many friends who are nurse practitioners and we don't get caught up in the NP or PA. Um, I think once we're out, we're focusing. You see patients. Yeah, we see patients and we, most of us are also, um, very happy to be working as part of a team. And that, I will tell you, is probably my biggest thing. Is there a different ph philosophical approach that someone who goes into a physician assistant program has that brings forth a different behavior? Because you mentioned being part of a team. Mm -hmm. Is it more of a team-based approach to care? Is it anything? What's different about it? I would say that's probably one of the biggest differences about it. I think when we come out, the majority of my colleagues, when we came out in practice, and again, this is a while ago, but I think that still stands. We like being part of a team. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't, you know, go on to medical uh, to become an MD, if you will. Um, some did choose that that's what they wanted to do, and I do have a few friends that went on after the PA oh program, I know. Um, I give them kudos because I was, I, I get to, I look at it as I get to do what I love and get the best of both worlds. I, so you take, uh, do you have a particular focus in your practice? Um, I started in family medicine, <clears throat> and I did that for 11 years. Loved it, and I think the most important thing, and I would say this with anyone, because my sister's now a nurse practitioner, um, is that you have a great mentor, um, and that your first job should be with a doctor um, who you get along with mm -hmm. um, and respect, and thankfully that was my first job. And for 11 years he taught me very well, and I think my foundation was, was great. I love seeing children. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, they're just so, well, innocent and un, you know, untouched. Um, but I also seem to gravitate towards elderly as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems to almost like be on the two spectrums. Not that I don't like my age as well, I do, but I'm just, it seems like I have a lot of fun with the younger children and the, and the older. Is there a lower limit to how young they can be to see you? At the current stage, yes. I, I'm comfortable six years old and up. Okay. When I was practicing in family medicine before. I would see infants, um, which I loved, but it's been a while since I've done that. Mm -hmm. So I feel I would need more, um, you know, retraining, if you will, to be very comfortable in that, in that spectrum again. Do you do procedures? Mm -hmm. I do. I love them. <laughs> what procedures have you been trained in? Oh, um, I do punch biopsies. Uh, I've done... So that's a skin biopsy usually? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I suture. 
Yep. So I, uh, if someone comes in with a laceration, I tend to do those as well. I do removals, staple removals, suture removals, um, freezing, cryosurgery, mm -hmm. um, cautery a little bit. Um, tend to shy away from uh, some of the more detailed things that involve surgery, if you will. And I think a lot, again, it depends on the, on the person, but I'm, my comfort level, if it's somebody who has um, something on their face. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. I don't think I would do anything on the face either. Right. right. Do you do GYN? Do you see women? I mean, yes. gynecological exams? Yes, yes. That involves, that's primary care again. Um, a lot of, t that's how I was trained. We did everything. I mean, when we do family medicine, you look at the person as the whole person. So there were no real, I, again, specialties at the time. It didn't right. seem like that was the case when I came out to start practicing in 93. You don't look old enough. And you had a career before you went to yes. be a PA. Yes. You were a medical technologist, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't look old enough to Thank you. say all these things. <laughs> you know, you've been in practice for 20 years yeah, at this point. I have. It doesn't seem real. It really, uh, I look back now and I still can't believe it. Um, I went to Northeastern and the program is phenomenal. And as a matter of fact, Susan Greenberg, uh, we just had a retirement celebration for her about a month ago. And we still kind of looked at each other, and I, I, it doesn't seem possible. It's been 20 years. I'm, I'm fortunate. I was able to get in there at a young age um, and really grow um, with the profession, but also grow as, as a person. So you also do energy work, mm. correct? Yes, I do. What does that mean? Well, I guess the best way to describe it would be it came to me. Um, and I don't think I went looking for it. As a matter of fact, one of my colleagues who is a PA heard of something called Reiki. And this was back in 2003 and asked if I may be interested. And in receiving a treatment or learning, giving a treatment? Learning how to give a treatment. She was actually interested in it for her animals. And so she asked me if I knew or would be interested in, in maybe taking a course with her. And at the time I said, well, isn't that funny? My mother-in-law is a Reiki master teacher. So why don't I approach her? And I really went there unwilling, well, I should say, um, kind of with a very open mind, but really for her. And in 2003, uh, we both became attuned into Reiki One. Uh, I will tell you that it was an amazing experience. Uh, I don't think I knew, I know I did not know at that time what was going to happen over the next few years. Um, it, it definitely brought me some peace, uh, but I would say that I found that it started to become more into my life. The, um, I left family medicine in 2005, began an urgent care job, and at that time when I was doing urgent care, I, I started to realize that if I had a patient on, you know, very quick, yeah, unfortunately at the time you're seeing patients rather quickly, and sometimes when you're there I was a little mm, trying to figure out a diagnosis, if you will, and I was letting my hands kind of guide me into you know, where their issue may have been. I would have a diagnosis in my mind, but I would also utilize this um, aspect of what I had learned. Can you say more about what Reiki is? <laughs> yes, um, I will give you the definition that I have been taught. Uh, Ray is universal life force energy, and Ki is that form that allows it to be. Um, so it's the power that it actually goes through in order to bring that universal life force energy into being. Um, it's hard to explain. I, I will tell you this, it's, it's almost like a feeling of, of peace and contentment. Um, and, and I will tell you, a lot of people will explain, you know, my hands feel funny or they feel hot or tingly. Um, when they're doing it or when, when they're they, receiving? Both. Well, actually, I should say, mainly when they're doing it. Uh, Practitioner-wise, it's definitely when you're doing the Reiki on somebody else because the energy goes through you. You're just a conduit. Okay. Um, the person who is actually receiving the Reiki, again, because the energy goes through us, it goes to the highest healing good. So that person on the table, even though you may know that person and you think that that person may need X, Y, or Z, there's always a higher good that the, it, it always finds its way to the highest healing good. That's, and it's very simple. I would tell you that. I would say Reiki is very simple um, and pure. And you put your hands on someone or you put your hands near someone? or You can do that either way. It's a good question because I always ask the person receiving, 
you know, I can offer this, I can do hands-on or near you if you're uncomfortable with that. Um, I think I've had one person um, in the course of many years now who said that they did not want hands-on. Mm -hmm. Most people are very happy to have hands-on. Does it make a difference in your treatment, hands-on, ha not hands-on, hands-off? Um, again, I only had that one person to really, <clears throat> and know the person still received it um, at the end was very peaceful. I always say I wish I could take before and after pictures of pe when they come onto the table and when they walk off the table. Do you have to lie down to get Reiki? You do not have to, as a matter of fact. It, it's, I prefer it because the person's very relaxed and it's very easy for me to maneuver around a table. Uh -huh. um, however, I've been able to do this in a nursing home setting um, with people sitting in a chair, my own relatives, especially if they're um, having injury and they can't get down on a table. Yeah. I've gone to patients in a hospital and seen them in a hospital bed. And, you know, obviously you're not going to have, you know, we're taught positions and hand positions, but, you know, I, it goes to the highest healing good. And as long as my, this is again, my feeling is as long as I can get to their head and their feet, I feel like they're receiving the Reiki. And most of them will say the same thing. They'll explain it as one, actually I've had two beautiful comments. One was from a man who was dying, a good friend, a father uh, of a good friend of mine. And he said to me, I don't know what you do or how you do it, but thank you. It was the best compliment and worth more weight in gold than anything I could ever receive yeah. because he was dying of cancer. It was very painful and yeah. he was choosing no morphine or at the so time. So can Reiki help with pain? Absolutely can help with pain. It's one of the best places I see it offered and being used. It can also be utilized in a surgery setting. I've seen it be used there as well. Um, and uh, sometimes even in endoscopy, there's actually a study that was done down in my area um, where they showed people who were going in for an endoscopy procedure and they were very anxious mm -hmm. and they received uh, the Reiki beforehand and it showed dramatic results of decreasing the anxiety. And then I would imagine if you decrease one's anxiety, the pain would go down or the recovery would quicken. Quicken, exactly. Okay, so mm -hmm. can we go back to 2005, I think yes. you said, when you went to this Reiki 1 class? It was, was it 2003? 2003 was right. Reiki okay. 1. Okay. 2005, I changed my job to go into urgent care because okay. I knew it was time okay. for a change. Uh, I needed to be challenged a little bit more, and so that's what I did. Um, and I loved the urgent care. I worked with a fantastic, uh, again, doctors. I got very lucky and um, colleagues um, who have since, we have since gone on to take Reiki 2 together, a few of the colleagues I work with. Um, and we run Reiki clinics to this day. So you, 2003, you walk into this class, you're going to support your friend. Yes. And then what happened? <laughs> Um, I, I mean, because you're just there for moral support. Right. Uh, and it wasn't really your thing. Right, exactly. And here we are talking about, are you a Reiki master? I am now. Yes. Okay, so yes. <laughs> what happened? The friend who brought me actually is not a Reiki master yet. Um, but it's funny because <laughs> I always thought she would be the one to, to go forward. And, and we don't know, that still may happen. Um, I think for me, it was the fact that... Um, when I became attuned, all I can explain to you is that I saw a beautiful white light and I could not describe what I saw because it was so beautiful. Um, I but know you were awake. I was awake. You weren't dying. You weren't on death. No. You know, people say that when sitting. they're confronting mm -hmm. death. Right. But this is not the case. No. No. It was from the teacher who had attuned me. What does and it mean to be attuned? To be attuned, uh, the teacher, actually, well, your eyes are closed. You're sitting in a chair. And there are uh, a series of attunements. In Reiki 1, there are four attunements. So she will actually stand above you, in front of you, and above you. And there are positions that you will be put in prayer position, if you will. Um, but then they come around, they put the hand on your head, um, your shoulders, and kind of work back to your hands. And there's a series of, again, four attunements for Reiki 1. And I know it's hard to understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... When this happened, mm -hmm. something opened up for you. Yes, yes, that's yes. I and and I didn't expect honestly anything to happen. I went there for my friend. Right, you went as a skeptic, actually, uh, sort of. Yes, I would say that that is definitely the truth. But can I precede that by one short story, which was probably a big factor in why I thought Reiki might be kind of neat to learn in a sense, when I was pregnant with my daughter. Um, 
in 1999, I had uh, PIH, or pregnancy-induced hypertension. I, they had tried to induce me, and I'm sure you know, but they gave me magnesium for like a week. Um, oh. And yeah, so it was not a fun episode, and my blood pressure was so high. They sent me home to see if I could go on my own. It didn't happen, and so I ended up going back into the hospital. At the time, I had a wonderful mi midwife, and I begged her, please do not put me back on that magnesium. I don't care what it is that you have to do. So she said, well, have you ever heard of Reiki? And I was like, well, I think so, you know. <laughs> and uh, she said, let me try this for you. So she did Reiki on me, and I never needed the magnesium, and my blood pressure was under control. But it wasn't before the Reiki. Correct. So your blood pressure was high. You said, please don't do that yep. nasty treatment. Yep. And she was able to sit with me during my labor, uh, not the whole time, but a good portion of it, I will tell you that. And her, I remember her being at my head and my shoulders. And so, yes, yeah, she was able to keep my blood pressure under control. So you had an experience with it that was very positive. Yes. Okay. Yes. So. Okay. So you get it attuned or tuned? Attuned. Attuned. Mm -hmm. It's called an attunement. And then what happened? Um, then after that, you spend 21 days where you practice the Reiki after, uh, after the attunement, and you journal what your experiences are. Mm -hmm. And then you share back with your teacher. Um, and again, we the other woman was a friend of mine, so we kind of shared our stories. She was using it a lot for her animals who were ill. Um, and I used it on my children a little bit, but mainly on myself at that time. So you can do Reiki on yourself? Oh, you can absolutely do Reiki on yourself. And actually, <laughs> I hate to say the word should, but I think that it is such a gift when you can do that. I do that so often now. It helps. I mean, there's so many situations that I, I think of the dentist, for instance. Uh, <laughs> and dentist, your blood pressure is high oh, already. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to say the dentist is one of the places where I've definitely had some anxieties. I'm sure a lot of people have. And I find now that I'm able to actually do Reiki on myself, and I lay there while he does the procedure, and I seem to do okay. So I feel it can't hurt anything. Mm -hmm. Have you done your blood pressure before and after your treatments? Um, I don't know that I actually have. I know that I had high blood pressure for a while, but I can't tell you that I've... I, I can just tell you my pulse rate was a lot lower. That yeah. part I definitely knew because I could check that yeah. easily. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after the 21 days, mm -hmm. you then went back for another class? or uh, Yeah, a few years came. So 2003 was Reiki 1. 2005, I was in a new space doing mm -hmm. urgent care and found that I was kind of leaning towards using it a little bit more than I even thought I was using it. Um, started to get around, again, some like-minded people that we were looking for a little bit more alternative um, things to help with healing. People I knew, colleagues, were interested in massage therapy and reflexology. So in 2008, um, there was an opportunity to take a Reiki 2 program. And I was, went, again, with a group of people, um, some who I knew, some who I did not know. Um, and we took a Reiki 2 class. And... I will tell you to this day, that was definitely the most profound for me. Um, Do you get attuned again in the class? Yes. Is it different than the level one? Yes, um, because a lot of the work, uh, if you will, is done by you. You're learning symbols, actually, in Reiki too. Um, and the symbols are, so you get taught a series of symbols, um, and then you're asked if you can, you know, kind of recall these symbols, and then we go through a, 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 almost a, an opportunity to uh, send Reiki because what it allows you to do in Reiki 2 is you can do distant healing, if you will, or send Reiki to a loved one if you can't get to them hands-on. Like an email. Like an email, exactly. <laughs> and an so, energy mail. You know what's so funny? That is a, so my mother-in-law, one of her favorite teacher, teaching sayings is, she said, you know, Linda, you have a cell phone, and I have a cell phone. She said, and I could be in Hawaii and call you. And you trust that that phone call will get to you. She said, but do you see a cord that connects us? No, but we trust it, right? She goes, then why can we not trust that there's energy in Reiki? Which makes sense. And there's a long history behind it. I mean, it's been, it's an ancient Japanese spiritual healing that's been around for a very long time. I was going to ask you that, so you mm. just answered one of my questions. Okay. Thank you. So how does being a Reiki master come into your practice as a physician's assistant? Does it inform you? Is it the platform on which you stand? Is it a layer on top of your physician? Like, where does it live for you? Oh, wow. That's, a, that's an evolving question. How's that? How about today? Today. 
Reiki is profound. I cannot think of my world not allowing me to practice this along with seeing people. Um, I've worked very hard to be in medicine and I do not want to lose the skills I have received. I feel they're very, um, I feel gifted to have received them and learned them. However, that being said, I have also experienced profound um, healing, if you will, um, in Reiki. And I feel that there's a place for both. So my ideal world would incorporate seeing a patient be, being able to offer them both. And as a practitioner, can you do Reiki in the midst of your physical exam? Sure. or And do you ask permission of someone or do you just do it? Do you see an imbalance? Um, well, I was in urgent care, I'll be honest with you, because it was still seen as yeah, kind of crazy. Um, I did it quietly, um, and it was more of a guide for myself, but I was finding that I was being guided, and it almost almost never misled me. If anything, it was more accurate than the brain sometimes. So it was a tool you used yes. to support your diagnosis Correct. and your treatment. Correct. So it was more inner focused, mm -hmm. it sounds like, mm -hmm. like a check, like, am I accurate here? Yes. Okay. Yes. And now um, I would say to you that, well, for the last year, most of my work had been, until I came to Visions, had been really enhancing the energy work. That's what I did for a full year um, and loved it. And I think I probably grew, I not probably, I grew in my confidence in the ability that it has a place and the hope and the desire that it actually will continue to have a bigger place mm -hmm. to be offered to people in all different modalities because it can be used in not only, you know, humans, and but you can use it in plants, you can use it in <laughs> animals, actually lots of animals are... And you mentioned your friend is doing Reiki yes. on her animals. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. So talk to me about permission because I think, mm -hmm. I think I know a lot of people want not to feel invaded. Correct. And want their boundaries to be honored. Yes. So do you do, like, does Reiki occur as an unconscious event or is it a conscious? I would, that's a good question. I would say it's more of a, a conscious um, event. Again, keeping in mind, for me, if I had an urgent care person, or a person that came in for an urgent care need and I was a little, I had a diagnosis in my mind, but I was still kind of like, hmm, which way could I go? I may not specifically ask that patient, right? right. Then I was, I was kind of using it for my own diagnosis right. to enhance it. However, if I was going to offer Reiki for somebody, I would always ask permission, always. I mean, that's something, because here's the thing, they have to be open mm -hmm. to, to receive it. You know, because really, if a person is unwilling to receive Reiki, it's not going to go to them. It's going to go to the highest healing good, and sometimes that may be back to the receiver, which I have experienced. And is this in the realm of energy? Is this energy fields? Is this imbalance? Do you see it? Do you sense it? How, how um, does it occur? I would say I feel it. And do you feel it in a particular part of your body? Hands. Your hands. Okay. Yeah, I would say definitely my hands. Um, I do not see it, if you will. Um, when I do a Reiki treatment on somebody, a lot of times my eyes are closed. And occasionally I may get messages. Um, if I could give you one story, um, it's probably one of the most profound for me, and it happened in October to let me know that I need to continue to follow this. I had a, a person that had come in, we had a Reiki clinic that was being offered where I was practicing outside of Visions. And I, most of the people just came to experience it and she went to get on the table to tell me what was going on and I said, please don't tell me. I said, medically, I said, I like to get you on the table and then kind of do the Reiki, let my hands kind of work my way and then afterwards I'll tell you where I found a lot of heat or vibration or energy, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then we can Is it a share. blockage or? Um, lots of times it can be, yes. Okay. I would say to you, um, my experience is if there's a lot of heat or vibration going into one part of the body, for instance, a knee, that particular knee usually has an issue with it. Okay, okay. that's just an example. Um, the woman who I had had on the table that came in October, she laid on the table for 30 minutes and afterwards I had experienced, I explained to her, I kept hearing to go to the shoulder in this area on her, and which I did. And then... Um, more importantly, it was, it was right here. 
And so at the end, I asked her, I said, this is where I'm picking up a lot of energy. Is there something going on? She revealed to me that she had had metastatic melanoma, and the first place that it was found was right here. Oh. So wow. I, yeah, it was very, very profound. I can't explain it. It's, again, it's not me. It goes, you know, through, if you will. So I think for me, it, it will continue to be a, a tool, but something that I hope will, I'll be able to continue to offer to people. How has it changed you? In every way. I mean, I didn't know you before. Yes. Um, most of the people who see me now say I look much more calm. I don't seem to be, my grandmother's favorite saying to me before she passed was, Linda, when are you going to stop and smell the flowers? I know what she means now. Stopping and smelling the flowers is just being quiet and taking time. I never used to take time for me. Um, that's part of it, and I used to think of it as being selfish. Mm -hmm. But I think when you finally learn to take time for yourself, go inside, it's not being selfish. It's actually being comfortable with oneself, and I feel a lot more at peace. And that's probably the best you know, I think in the beginning, and especially anyone who has a career, you, you know, have an agenda. I always had an agenda. If I just get to here, if I just get to here, mm -hmm. then I'll be okay. You know, if I, and now I live for today. You know, I have today, and that's what I have, and I'm going to try to enjoy as best I can. Of course, we all falter, <laughs> but I would tell you I do my best to enjoy every moment of every day. It's hard to picture you as a, what I would say is frenetic or twanging you because know, I've only known you I've known you for what two a year and a half two years yeah, I think I met you about a year and a half when I first came to visions yeah praying I would get the job so <laughs> it's only been not that long and you've right. always been what I would consider to be extremely chill mm. so that's I'm glad. very interesting <laughs> if you spoke with my mother or happened to see me perhaps in uh, about two years ago um, it was a job that uh, wasn't a fit for me that's, I think that's probably the nicest way to put it. Yeah. Um, and, but in the same sense, there's no mistakes. If I hadn't been in that job, I wouldn't have been able to take the leap of faith um, to say, you know what, I, I really need to do something that feels right, mm -hmm. you know, in every sense of the being, in, in, in mind, body, and spirit, and I mean that. Um, you know, to smile, to go to work right now is such a blessing. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from... Lots of my colleagues who I still encounter, not at Visions, <laughs> but um, elsewhere. I don't think that that happens a lot right now. I think there's a lot of people that unfortunately are frustrated. So no. it's brought you great balance, it sounds yes. like. So we're approaching the end of the show. Is there anything that I've missed? Actually, I know there's one thing. You do accept insurance. Yes. And you see kids, anybody f who's six and up. Correct. That's where I'm okay. comfortable, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you see as old as they get. Yes. Yes, I would say that is the case, even when they're, you know, kind of, uh, if you will, palliative, too. Again, not so much here at Visions, but some of the work that I do outside of here. Yeah. Yes. And can they do, I don't even know the answer to this, can, mm -hmm. they, can you do Reiki at Visions? I would love to do Reiki at Visions. Okay, so we'll talk about that offline. Yes, that would be my dream. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Visions for Health. My guest today was Linda Cleary, Certified Physician's Assistant.